It's Injustice just, isn't just poverty. Right. It, it is poverty. Yeah. And there are root causes and other things that have contributed to that. But there are many, many, many injustices nationally that we need to, as the people of God, be willing to respond to and engage with in dialogue. And that's, that's the beginning. Welcome to Down to Earth. I'm Jessica De Sabatino, And I'm Joyce Reese. And this is a show where we want to be real about God, the scriptures, and how we live our Christian faith out in real time, honoring God and shaping our culture and community around us. We dialogue about the purpose of vocational artists, social justice, generational transformation, why we bother with church, and a whole lot more. We're Joyce and Jess, and we're friends, pastors, and speakers. We thought perhaps we could work on this project together and have a little fun. Our goal is to talk about things we have passion for, connect with others about what matters to them, and together impact our world and honor God. So welcome to, um, I guess it's episode seven now. We're going to continue to talk a bit about justice this morning, just carrying on a bit from our last episode. And in that episode, we talked a bit about discerning like the bad news people live with and then bringing a good news announcement in contrast to their bad news as an act of justice. We're going to talk a bit more about that today, tell a few stories, just unpack kind of some of the ways we've seen that work. And we're also going to carry on the idea of asset-based community development. We kind of had that frame of reference from our last episode, just talking about not just looking at the needs, but looking at the gifts and the people and calling for more of that as an emphasis for transformation. One of the things I was going to mention is I have a good friend, colleague named Bob Ekblad. He is part of Tierra Nueva in Burlington, Washington. He's kind of spearheaded that movement, working with migrant workers. Bob's also written a really awesome book called Reading the Bible with the Damned. Excellent book. If you've never read it before, you need to go out and get that book. It's transformational in how we help people locate their own story in the biblical text, people that have been oppressed or suffered injustice. And he's done some really phenomenal work in the prisons in that area in Washington State. Anyway, Bob one time was teaching a course I was in, and he said, we always have to look at making sure that method and message are aligned. So how we bring good news actually ought to fit with the type of good news we're bringing. So, you know, this isn't necessarily from a justice lens, but the church is particularly evangelicalism, post-revivalism. We've had kind of a bend toward turn or burn, uh, like as an announcement of good news, that doesn't sound super good. You know, it's like, that's a, you're supposed to be bringing good news, but it sounds like bad news. And so when we bring good news to people, and say they're living in poverty, we don't tell them, pull up your bootstraps and get your butt in gear and, you know, like work harder. That doesn't, that doesn't sound like good news when you've been barely scraping by and working your tail off to survive. Yeah. And so this idea that we come alongside people and that we don't downward relate, I think it's the most important part of justice-based gospel ministry. I think the idea that we pet the poor or that we are just kind to people because it makes us feel good, is really undermines the whole idea that the gospel is meant to be lived out shoulder to shoulder. Yeah. And And that we're all image bearers. Right. right. And that there is no hierarchy in the kingdom. There can't be hierarchy. And I think part of why I'm really passionate about talking about justice is I think if we're not careful, there's the celebritization of the evangelical world. So you have fancy people at the top, and those are the people that, I don't know, can talk with a microphone or... Lead whatever the They play the guitar really well, or they're just stinking good looking, and we have them on our Instagram feed. And and I and I am concerned about that. I, I think that is lack of understanding of the theology of justice because justice says we are all in this together yeah. and that at some level we're all broken and that at some level we all need this good news. Yeah, like, just because you're beautiful and have everything together does not negate your need for a savior as much as the person who's street entrenched and mm-hmm. hasn't had a bath in six years and we are all in this together. And that is not lip service. That is truth. Yeah. 
And we have to really have that as our orientating posture, Jess. Yeah. If we come noble me, like we talked last episode, noble me, needy them, or the like what I call the doctor-patient relationship, you'll never get the real flourishing of a kingdom community that Jesus called us to. It impedes the possibility of the priesthood of all believers that both the Old and New Testament talk about as God's aim for humanity. So we have to find a way to keep our heart posture yeah. in a way of relating that is mutually reciprocal. Absolutely. That's uh, really, really important. When we think about mutual reciprocity, we have to consider John chapter 4, where Jesus comes to, through Samaria, we don't have to unpack all of that. He didn't have to be there. That was already him entering into a place of alienation and stigma. And then he has that conversation with the woman at Jacob's well. This is really, really important for us just to look at that text briefly to realize she gave him something first. She gave him a cup of water, and then he, of course, gave her life and revelation that he was the Messiah. Of course, that's really important to realize. He gave crazy privilege to her. She's the first person in the biblical text he revealed he was the Messiah to, so not church leaders or temple leaders, you want to think of it that way, synagogue rulers, not even his disciples or his inner sanctum of people. He tells this Samaritan woman who's already stigmatized because of the social reality, the mixed racial reality of the Samaritans, but then even within her own village, she is very, very marginalized. And then gives her not just good news to her, but through her, right? We've talked about that, I think. Yeah. And I think you got to remember how scandalous this would be. Right. In the Middle East today, this would be scandal, right. let alone 2,000 years ago. So I think of myself in a church leadership position and think, Imagine if somebody who was not a believer, had not said the magic Jesus prayer, and they came in to your church, so to speak, and told you that they'd had some major revelation from God right. himself. Well, that just seems like uh, almost laughable. Right. But that's the kind of God we serve, a God that scandalizes us with his ability to reach out to people that we don't see. Right. And that is the message of the gospel at the end of the day. Yeah. That is the embodiment of Jesus's good news, right. that we, there is no hierarchy anymore. There are no rules anymore. He threw those all out and said, listen, there is nothing that you can do to gain my grace or my favor. It's given to you, freely given to you. I think as church leaders or people who have some role or even just longing for more of God, we invite God to give us eyes to see. And then He will help us. He will help us see in, in this way where we'll make room differently. So I have a good friend, Nathan Rieger. He pastors in Winnipeg, the Winnipeg Center Vineyard. And a bunch of years ago, you know, they were doing what lots of churches are doing in terms of, you know, good, hard engagement with their neighborhood in the north end of Winnipeg. And good practices, orientating practices around justice. But they had an internship program. And that was, you know, to develop leaders in the church and to reach the next generation to lead in the body of Christ. Really good, normal things churches do. Free labor in churches. <laughs> but one day, Nathan somehow, I don't know if it came in discussion with someone or in prayer, but he thought, why do we only have church interns? Why don't we have street interns? Like, wouldn't there be gifts in the community that we could strengthen and equip? So they decided to, to develop a parallel internship program for people on the street. And like, when I talked to Nathan and Andy and some of the others there, they said, well, you know, there's the obvious, like, the go-to sort of drug dealers and the people that everybody goes to if they get stabbed or beaten up. And like, those are natural leaders in the community. So they went one by one to the ones they knew of and said, hey, we're going to do this leadership development. And we'd love for you guys to come along and be a part of it because we see you as leaders in the community. Like when I heard about this, I just thought that is genius. Yeah. Like I would never have thought of it. Right. But this is a reach for justice and transformation that's asset-based, right? It's mm -hmm. saying, actually think you have something to contribute. Right, yeah. because the image of God rests right. inside of you, because the Imago Dei, you, you are... Right, and you obviously have some entrepreneurial skills, or you right. obviously have some leadership skills that is already being leveraged. So they created this parallel internship program, and then they made the interns, church interns and street interns, work together for a special event that they were doing. This is a few years back. So they had invited, I don't know, like the mayor, the head of public health, premier, the 
everybody who was anybody who had any voice and authority in their province and particularly in their city around issues of social justice and transformation, they invited to an evening like supper on a Friday, brunch, breakfast thing, Saturday morning, and then a lunch. And so it was like almost a one-day conference kind of idea. And they said, we're going to do it through dialogue. We're going to have tables, we're going to have food, and we're going to have three questions for the three meals. So they told the street interns and the church interns, you have to work together to source the food, make the food. So, you know, high First Nations population. So these guys could get access because they knew somebody who had a fishing license or a hunting license. And so I think they came with like elk or deer meat and salmon. And they got the really, really good stuff. And the church interns could go to like Safeway and ask for leftovers and go to Starbucks and ask for leftovers. And they found their way to like create this meal together. Three meals, technically. And then they asked three questions around the table. So they put street interns and church interns and dignitaries, if you want to call them that, at the tables for these three meals. And they asked these three questions. First of all, the the first question was something like, what's your dream for our neighborhood? If you don't know, the north end of Winnipeg has, I think, upwards of 70,000 First Nations people. It's like kind of considered the largest reserve in Canada that's not a reserve, you know. It's a really amazing full population of First Nations people. So what's your dream for our neighborhood? It was kind of like asking, where are we going? And then where are we at now? What are our present realities? You know, they're kind of getting at that. That was the second meal. And then what's the next doable step? Or kind of looking at what can we do individually and how can we collaborate? I like to say, if I paraphrase their three questions for the three meals, it was like, what's the problem? What's the solution? And what are the first steps? And this was so interesting what came out because the street interns had a very different perspective on what is the problem. Church interns and dignitaries thought the problem was sniffing and alcoholism and drug addiction and just out of control behaviors in the neighborhood that was leading to crime and whatever, loss of children, you know, into the welfare foster care system. And so they just thought, that's the problem. But the street interns were like, no, that's not the problem. That's our solution. They're like, it's not a good solution, but the problem is the undercurrent of pain underneath there from long trajectory from residential schools and foster care system and addictions coming to the reserves. And like, we have all kinds of long history and perpetuated pain So that's what's underneath there, not our out-of-control behaviors that we see. And I think that's really important to recognize because the ability to see the root problem, the bad news that was in their community, was only really known by the people who were suffering because of the bad news. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so important for us to recognize we don't really know what the bad news is that others are living with or suffering under without them telling us. So, and that requires relationship, right? It required them having some opportunity to dialogue. And then, of course, the imagination and what came out of those three meals was totally different than if they were just trying to address the symptoms, not the root causes. Yeah, right. I think we often try to have discussions about people for people. Right. And that is what contributes to downward relating. So we're going to think about the worst neighborhood in whatever city you live in, whether it's Portland or Seattle or Phoenix. You're you're going to say to yourself, oh, what's the worst neighborhood? Okay, whatever it is. And then what could we do to fix it? Well, you don't know. Until you've lived there, you don't know. And and, And that's humility. So all justice has to start with humility saying, I don't know. Yes. I have not lived there. Yeah. And even though maybe you've lived a reality that has been hell in and of itself, you haven't lived in that reality. And so this idea of coming to the table saying, I don't know what to do, but God does. And perhaps the people who are living in that hell know what to do. And it requires relationship, which isn't always the easiest, right? Like that takes time. I remember people saying, well, what can we do for the poor, right? Like, and I, I don't like, I don't like that question. Because I want us to think about what can we, how can we reach for relationship with people who are marginalized in society? And in a lot of ways, this is, it goes beyond just the poor as we typically think of them. 
it's injustice just, isn't just poverty. Right. It, it is poverty. Yeah. And there are root causes and other things that have contributed to that. But there are many, many, many injustices nationally that we need to, as the people of God, be willing to respond to and engage with in dialogue. And that's that's the beginning. Pauline was really good at this, the lady who founded Jacob's Well, mm. Pauline Fell. Because she spent 10 years doing the serving soup on the corner and helping with this nonprofit and that outreach. And, you know, this was when she was 50. No, sorry, 60. So 60 to 70, that's what she did. And then she turned 70 and she thought, this isn't great because it's just us and them. Like, I want relationship. So after 10 years as a 70-year-old woman, she just thought, well, how could I get relationships? So she started going into the bars. you got to imagine this, right? Like, church lady, white hair, twin set pearls into, you know, really pretty grungy, intense social environments in the downtown east side of Vancouver. She just came with kindness and and a listening ear, a listening posture. And I mean, how many times did I sit at a table in a bar where everybody was arguing over who got to buy Sprite for Pauline, right? And just that welcome. And so when she finally, at 85 years of age, thought, I better give this away before I die, what she had to give away was the inheritance of relationship, right? right? That was her wealth. I want to be that kind of person who has found my way in and listened. That's part what happened with Nathan in Winnipeg is he listened. Mm -hmm. And then he could discern something in terms of how to get their voice to the table. My friend Patrick, he's living in Victoria now, but... He's part of a family business. They're chicken farmers. He doesn't, you know, do the actual farming. He runs the business side of things with his brother and his dad. But there came a time where Patrick, a number of years ago, had to fly to the Philippines to find halal certified slaughterers of chicken. Okay, so this isn't a skill set that's easily found here in Canada. And they are sort of a higher end chicken company product. So he had to have specialized people. So he went there and he hired, um, let's see if I can remember, I think he hired 17 people. And he brought them back, you know, or he got them their work visas. It's always temporary skilled worker visas at that time. And so these 17 people came from the Philippines and got working, you know, in their processing plant. And after six months, one of the guys had gone back. He didn't like it, didn't want to stay in Canada. So he had these 16 workers. And naively, Pat sat down with them one day and said, you know, how's your time been so far in Canada? And what can we do to help you? And, you know, it's probably around now that we should be thinking about getting more paperwork if you want to stay. And they were just like, Mr. Pat, can we stay? And he was like, well, I don't see why not. I mean, I don't want to go back to the Philippines and find more people. Like, you're good people. And so they all said unanimously, like, well, we all want to. So he thought, oh, good, I'll get that paperwork in order. Well, of course, you know what happened, right? He went to try to get that, and he was told, no, they have temporary work visas. They can only stay for two years or less. He's like, how does that make any sense? Then I have to go back to the Philippines, find more workers, and hire them? Like, why are we doing this? We don't have these skilled workers, so I need migrant workers. Long story short, Pat knocked on doors, he made phone calls, nobody could help him. And so he was like, well, who's got authority to change this? And the authority was with the Minister of Labor or whatever in Victoria. It was a provincial issue. That That's where he had to go, at least at that point. So Patrick did. He got an appointment and he went, he brought a friend with him because he was a little bit nervous. Some aide to the minister came and said to him beforehand, you have 18 minutes we would really recommend that you just lay out your case in the you know, first 10 minutes and then you have a handful of minutes to interact. You maybe ask some questions you can respond to. So Patrick's like, okay. So he went in thinking he was meeting with the minister. There was like, I don't know, 12 or more people in the room, people taking notes, people learning, people with authority who could pull a file on this or that. It was like kind of intimidating. And Pat said he wasted 14 minutes just telling stories about his people who didn't want to have to go back because they actually found a good job and they were making adequate provision for their families. They would love for their families to be able to come. And and then they kind of interrupted, like, you only have four minutes left, sir. And he was like, oh, okay. But he had the minister's ear because he knew, he knew the stories. Right. 
He knew the people. He right. knew the problem. The bad news they were living with was that they had to go back home and then start again. And he, that was bad news for him as a businessman. Right. The long and short of that story is they got the law changed. Right. And all kinds of ripple effect after that for all kinds of migrant workers. Right. And I think, so the point is this, that you just have to do what's in front of you. Because maybe you've been listening for the last five or six minutes thinking, well, I, I don't live on the downtown east side of right. Vancouver. Maybe I live on the bridal path in Toronto and there ain't nobody that's suffering there. Or maybe, I don't know, you're not a farmer and so you, you don't have interaction with migrant workers. I will tell you this, that the way that the gospel works, the way that our God works is that he always puts people in front of you. He always puts things that we can put our hand to and justice issues that we can, that we can address. So in my own life, I had, I mean, I probably always had a bit of a bent towards justice, but I mean, I'm a, I was a teacher. I was like a regular Joe. I love math. I'm a total nerd. Don't send me your math questions so I don't know them anymore. I told this to a group of people and then got hundreds of people asking me for help with math. Every day I'm so nervous when I check my inbox. But anyways, I'm like a regular young adult. At that time, you are not a young adult anymore. I would like to be in my heart of hearts. <laughs> that big four row is looming in a month. <laughs> So I, I am a regular, I just, I live in a suburb. My dad is a banker. I didn't grow up in some hard-nosed kind of place, but I was teaching and in the middle of my teaching, I got a call in the middle of one day saying, you need to come down to the office. And I always say to people that I was 20 something. So I thought I was getting a promotion to what I don't know, because <laughs> this makes no sense, but you know, 20 something bravado. And I get into, uh, I walk down the hall and get into my principal's office and he said, you are going to want to sit down. And if you've ever had a conversation like that, you know that the air kind of gets sucked out of the room. He said, your, your brother's been in a major workplace accident and they've airlifted him to a major hospital in Toronto, the head, the head trauma hospital in Toronto and a pastor's coming to pick you up. Well, you know, when clergy's coming to pick you up, this is all bad news. So I get in the car and go down to the hospital. And as I was coming into the hospital, I could see a young man wearing a shirt that my brother was wearing, being pushed out on a gurney, but it didn't look like him. There was blood everywhere. And that was my brother. My brother lived for six days. And after the seventh day, he died. Well, the long and short of it is that he was killed in a workplace accident. And I was thrust into a world that I didn't know existed. I didn't know that in the world, more people will die this year from a workplace accident than will die from heart disease, cancer, then will die from car accidents, then will die from suicide, and then will die from war. Yeah, this is crazy. a major, major issue. Justice issue. A just a major justice issue. And I began to look in the scriptures and realized God talks about this all over the yeah. prophets, all over saying, talking about the worker and how you treat them and how this is related to his kingdom. Yeah. And then, so now, I, I, if you had told me that, that part of my role would be to go all over the world and talk about safety, I would have laughed at you in the face because it wasn't something that I wanted to sign up for. Right. And it wasn't the justice issue that you would have thought No, of. I would have liked to have lived. I, I always said I, I wanted to live on the backside of some desert, nobody knowing my name and helping orphans. It sounded nice. But instead, my life has been about interacting with presidents of major Fortune 500 companies, of interacting with the prime minister and premiers and state legislators. And so I, I will say this, and I always say this to people, if you will say to God, God, my heart is towards you. I want to be someone that brings your good news to bear on the earth. God is going to give you an opportunity to bring good news. And, and it, is, it is no relation to your personality, whether you're extroverted, introverted. It has no relation to that. No, whether you're good looking or smart or whatever. Right. There's things that God will, if we ask Him to open our eyes, open our ears, and give us a heart to respond, watch out. Yeah. Because He will actually highlight to you the thing that He's created for you to speak to or engage with or support or help find a way to raise the voice for. Yeah. And I, I always say to people, if you're looking for what is that thing, I say to people, look in two areas. First, look in your pain. So yeah. in everybody's story, there's pain. And often I think that pain can be a precursor 
to destiny yeah. and can be a precursor to what God would have you lean your shoulder into. And then I also say to people, what makes your heart beat faster? So what is it when you're watching the news that, or you're reading twi- your Twitter feed that just either makes you hot it's under you. the collar yeah. or makes you weepy? Mm. And those are the things that you you don't have to apologize for leaning into. I, I think oftentimes people will think that they are not qualified. So I'm not qualified. But Joyce, were you qualified to go to the downtown east side? No. I am not qualified to be talking to... Schwigs. No, I'm not qualified to go to these fancy shindigs where I have yeah. to wear heels that I am very worried that I'm going to fall down in. Mm-hmm. I'm not qualified to address world issues. But the thing is, you just do it. Right. It's not and thinking it's, about it. you know what? And it is part of your pain narrative, Jess. Like yes. if David hadn't died the second day on the job at a bakery. Right. Like this, you know, for people listening, this is shocking. And to realize all of a sudden a gross injustice, not just in your brother's story, but in many people's stories was uncovered. today. Right. Today here in Canada. in Canada. In the world, every 15 seconds, somebody dies of a workplace accident, a preventable one. Right. And that's the crazy thing is somebody then had to be awakened to that and then began to advocate for that. And of course, you and your dad, your brother, Caleb, you're not the only ones no. that are addressing this, but you have done something that is quite remarkable. And, you know, for, our, for friends that are listening, like I, I just want to mention that Jessica and her dad, Rob, received the Governor General Award in March for their work in workplace safety with My Safe Work here in Canada. And that means they're doing something really effective. It's making waves. It's actually changing the trajectory for people. It's saving lives. And young workers in particular are way better equipped going into jobs to know I need to ask for orientation and training. And I need to know that I it's okay for me to speak up if I don't feel safe. And those two, like particular things have changed a justice issue in the workforce in Canada. Like it makes me think of Dorothy Day, right? Like you go way back in the Catholic worker movement, New York City, and you have this narrative of a woman who like, let's be honest, you read Dorothy's biography. If you have never read anything about Dorothy Day, I would really encourage you to to read about her. Many books have been written about her and by her. Her granddaughter just wrote a really great... Yeah, The World Will Be Saved by Beauty or something along those lines, she's quoting one of the Russians. You know, you look at that woman who, what was the first issue? Well, it was something tied to her own pain. She didn't think it was fair that women weren't allowed to vote. And she was one of the very first people who got arrested in the United States and went to jail to fight for the suffragettes. But she also was a newspaper writer. She was a skilled artist, if you want to call her that. And she would be walking in New York to the paper and like the Great Depression had happened. There was all kinds of poverty around her. And she saw the working poor every day. And she began to know them, converse with them on the street. And she was a brave lady, Mm -hmm. but she wasn't a perfect lady. She'd had a kid out of wedlock. She'd come to Jesus kind of accidentally. She, she was a a bohemian, a part of an arts community. Right. And she had no narrative that would have suggested that she should stand up for the working poor. Right. Her father was a journalist. Her father's father was a journalist. They they were an educated law. People, yeah. And that we would think of her as legendary decades later. A sort of Mother Teresa in America is remarkable Mm -hmm. because... She wouldn't, you would never have thought she was on that path. Just like we would never have thought, Jess, that you were on the path right. of advocating for workplace safety. Right. Yeah. And that, that it's is important for, yeah, yeah it's That's, important for us to realize. Cause I think when you were talking at the beginning about celebrity culture and elitism and like it's this mutuality and it's the level playing field and it's a humility posture mm-hmm. that just says what's in front of me mm-hmm. and I'm going to reach my hand toward that. None of us ever become known or, regarded in our care for the oppressed, except in hindsight. Right. And it's that long trajectory. And some of us will just be quiet supporters and our local contacts finding new ways to figure out what's the bad news and then live a good news announcement. I read an article not long ago on the CBC about some folks in a neighborhood in Winnipeg. You know when you, well, if you walk through my neighborhood, you'll find those little um, 
find a book, take a book kind of. Little red houses. Yeah, well, or mine's mine's pink. We've got just, so somebody built one and there's actually two right around the corner from my house. It's just a local community library that you don't have to sign anything out. It's an honor system. Take a book and bring a book back. If you have books to share. Well, these guys in Winnipeg thought we should do a community pantry like that. So they did. They just set it up and they put non-perishable items in there. And if you're hungry, you can just take food. And if you have things to contribute, you can put stuff in there. And it's really working, right? That's just a small imagination. Hey, what's some of the bad news in our community? How could we live a good news announcement, right? So that doesn't sound like, and I meet with the prime minister and I, right? right? It's just what's in front of you. Right. It's really important for us to think about that. I wonder if anybody listening, I mean... Obviously, I'm Canadian. i always looking for the Canadian heroes. Cindy Blackstock, who runs First Nations and Family Caring Society and has become a tremendous advocate for First Nations children nationally. You know, she, when she was in university, she worked in a, like a group home or some kind of narrative. Yeah, it was a group home, I think, with adolescent First Nations kids. And she was studying social work, I think, and she just thought, yeah, but like... How did they get here? Or why are they here? She started asking big why questions, kind of like Patrick was asking, well, why can't these workers stay? Or why can't Nathan was asking, you know, why can't the gifts and the street be leveraged in another context? And so she, that was the starting point for her, where she just began to ask questions about the bad news people were living with and why so many of these kids had ended up in foster care. And she began to look at the conditions that put them there because she wanted to get at the root cause, not just treat the symptoms, not just be a worker in a group home, not just be a social worker apprehending or. And so she started doing something about it. She said recently, as I think, well, recently, I'm getting old. Recently is like 2011 or 2012 or something, but... Still recently, Joyce. Okay, so she said, we have never had more First Nations children in child welfare care than we do at this moment. Our best estimate is that there are more First Nations children in child welfare today in Canada than at the height of the residential schools by a factor of three. That's an astonishing statistic. She said in provinces like Alberta, where Jessica and I live, 65% of all children in child welfare care are First Nations, even though they represent well under 10% of the child population in our province. In BC, it's 53%. So if you take those two provinces alone, we're talking about 11,000 First Nations children living in foster care. That's shocking, right? So I don't know if you remember, in 2011, there was a huge scandal in the... James Bay community of Attawapiskat in the north, and it left children incredibly vulnerable. There was water problems and shortage of housing, and it made national news. It was like third world problems or two-thirds world problems here in Canada people were unaware of. And Cindy got asked in an interview, did the housing crisis in Attawapiskat serve as a turning point in national awareness about poverty on reserves? And might have it contributed indirectly to transformational change. And she said, look, I hope that Attawapiskat was a turning point. She said, I think many Canadians would agree that if the government cut off power, sewer, safe drinking water, and put us all in tents, it would not be long until our ability to care for our children would suffer. See, she's looking at root causes and things that are underneath why the kids are in care or why the kids are being apprehended. And she said this, the reasons why First Nations children go into child welfare care are poverty, poor housing, and caregiver substance misuse. And, you know, there's pain underneath that. She said the good news is that these are problems people can do something about. The bad news is the federal government so drastically underfunds child welfare on reserves that it makes it really hard to tackle problems. And so she's become like advocacy and fundraising and getting resources onto the reserves that aren't going to come via the Canadian government or not right away, right? So she's working both sides. Let's find a way to advocate and raise awareness and let's find a way to find resource and people who will care and live this out. I mean, you were just in the North Mm -hmm. and met some amazing people who are doing some amazing work. Resilient people who decided, I I met Older people who had decided to give up their businesses and come live amongst, and not in a downward relating sort of way, but just to live amongst young uh, reserves are young by by virtue of many children on them. 
but older couples who just gave up their lives to come live amongst people, be grandma and grandpa to kids. And, and that's had a tremendous impact on many of the places that they live. And beautiful stories of, I came away from the Northwest Territories thinking, justice is not a, you don't have to be 21 to decide that you're going to live a life of justice. You can be 73 right. or 62 Pauline's or 55. Example, yeah. It is just about doing what is in front of you yeah. instead of contemplating it actually doing it right and there there's a big difference i think we are a nation and i think as evangelicals we are very good at pontificating about yeah. things when then when i get my education done when i earn a certain amount of money when i retire when i my kids are growing we have all kinds of excuses i'll start to engage my life with these people when and that that day will never come no, I, and I think like I, I, if I had a dollar for everybody who'd, who's read Bob Eckblad's book mm. and wanted to talk about it, we'll do something about it. Right. And you're not going to be perfect and you're not going to have it figured all out and it's not going to be it's one beautiful. Foot in front of the other. I mean, I used to have people say to me, well, it must be so awesome to like have a ministry where you have so many amazing stories. And I always look across the table at them and say, that's because I didn't have time to tell you the 9,000 stories where it was a train wreck. Right. Where, where it isn't an awesome story, right. where it, where it's not perfect. And we do live in this gray kind of fallen world. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that we don't stop reaching. That doesn't mean that we don't stop saying, well, there's always been a problem on the reserves. Or there's always been a problem in inner cities. Jesus said, you'll always have the poor amongst you. I hate it when people use that, that text out of context because Jesus wasn't saying, this is awesome. Do no, nothing saying, about it. Go get yourself engaged. Right. There's always going to be something for you to do. Yeah. We are never going to live in a utopia, yes, because there's sin in the world, right. but that does not give us the right to just have our little wonderland and totally. close our eyes and go, oh, well, there'll always be the poor amongst us. Right. And, you know, last week we talked about, uh, or in the last episode, rather, we talked about the difference between mercy and justice. And, you know, we don't want to just come with Band-Aids or ambulances, right? We want to get it sort of the root causes. And that that means question asking, it means relationship. But it also means we're going to do both and we're going to be like looking at the systemic issues. And maybe we have to advocate like you are with the government or like Cindy is w with the government, you know, on yeah. behalf of First Nations kids. But it, it may mean we also have to take in a foster kid right. or we have to adopt someone or we have to kind of get on the ground in this narrative. I, I actually think the church could do so much more. We have 69,000 kids in care in Canada. Mm -hmm. That's like, we don't have orphanages, but we have 69,000 orphans. Some 35,000 are up for adoption right now. Ain't nobody adopting them, or very few, right? Because they come with, you know, difficulties or they're not cute little babies anymore, right? I'm passionate about this issue. You know, I wrote a little booklet. If you're interested in getting it, I wrote something called Living the Gospel Through Adoption. And I'm trying to just help us frame it as um, actualizing of good news, actualizing of the gospel from a kingdom theology perspective. And that little booklet, you know, I don't earn money on it. It's to fund adoptions in Canada through Abbas Fund. These are remarkable people who thought, hey, one of the big barriers for people to adopt is it's expensive. Mm -hmm. So we're going to help people find a way they can get grants and we can help resource. But there's also imaginations that are emerging across the country in local churches where like 20 families will chip in so that one family can, you know, be the primary family and do the adopting. But then they're the people that come around and support them and do respite care or bring them food or throw the party, the welcome home party, instead of just the baby showers for the people who have birth children, right? And we're getting a different imagination for what it looks like for us to do some of these things together. I just was at the Together for Adoption conference here in Calgary. I was speaking at it recently. Ann Voskamp was there. She's obviously, um, you know, well-regarded writer and communicator in terms of just what a real life lived in Jesus looks like and New York Times bestseller. Anyway, she and her husband and their kids have just welcomed a baby girl from China and they've just done this adoption process. And she, if you haven't heard Anne talk about how unglamorous this is, and she always says, you know, it isn't a magical story, right? Like this has got pain. There is no adoption without pain in the background. Mm -hmm. Right, so my my six year old said this to me on Sunday morning, driving to church, 
listening to tunes in the car. Everyone was quiet. And he goes, out of the blue, he said, Mom, adoption is always kind of sad, isn't it? And I said, why? And he said, because it means that they had to lose their family first. I just thought, why are you even thinking about that? Like, I just heard Anne say this three weeks earlier, and I never said it to him. And so I just think even little kids, right? God stirs our hearts and makes us get eyes. Mm -hmm. We can do something about that. Maybe you're the the one who begins to advocate and raise awareness. We had a woman in our our last church we were pastoring at who was in her early 20s. Their first, her and her husband, their first baby died when he was born, and she was in a tremendous amount of pain. But she then started thinking about loss, and she started thinking about adoption, and she just went around the church and found out who all had been adopted, who had been fostered, who fostered, and who had adopted. And she said, I think we should do like a kind of small group where we can hear these stories. It was brilliant. It was just genius. I was like, Julia, do it. And so we just started getting people together where we could hear their story of being adopted or of adopting or being a foster parent. And do you know what that did is it started to inspire the imagination of many people to participate in actualizing good news. Mm -hmm. So it's it's both and you got to look at the systemic and then address it, but it has to get addressed on the ground and lived in real ways. Yeah, and sometimes you can't address the systemic until you have skin in the game. Right. So sometimes you just got to be a doer for some time until you get your head around things. So the question is, what is right in front of you to do? There are things right in front of you to do. There's pain in your life that would say to you, that would try to stop you from doing something. You can just decide, no, I'm going to be a doer. I'm going to push through the pain. I'm going to actually, in some ways, put myself in the middle of the pain. And God blesses that. He totally does. And, you know, sometimes even when you're in the game, I had skin in the game and the Jacobs Well context, the downtown east side, I'd already been there for, I don't know, three or four years. And I was super discouraged because I was like, how is how are we ever going to see transformation? Like, I looked at the narrative in the neighborhood. I looked at the stats. I looked at the history. And I was like, we got 84 nonprofits in how many square blocks? Third of them faith-based. We've been doing this thing for 130 years. Ever since addiction showed up in the neighborhood, there's been Christian response in mission, if you want to call that. St. James Mission started the same year, the first brothel and the first pub began, and things were out of control. So I just was asking the Lord about that. And I remember standing in the window, praying, looking out at the street, and the chaos was going past the door. And I was pretty discouraged. And then the Lord just showed me, like, there's still orphans in their distress, James 1, 26. Like, what's pure and faultless religion before God and our Father? It's to take care of widows and orphans in their distress and to keep yourself unpolluted from the world. You know, I've thought about that. I've taught on that a bajillion times, but it's both and, right? So you get your eyes to see looking outward, and you get your heart engaged. And even then, sometimes you're in the game, you don't really know what the issues are. So I just started thinking, are they really orphans in their distress? And I started asking questions of my friends on the street and realized, yeah, like 85% of the people we worked with, and that was into the hundreds of folks, had either come through foster care or residential schools, right? But with the listening posture, you start reaching for some transformation. But the other part of that verse is you also have to keep yourself unpolluted from the world. And I've long thought about what does that look like? And I don't think it's like... I don't smoke, I don't chew, I don't go with girls who do or whatever that old thing. Yeah, boys, right? So you look at that history, you think, what does it mean? And for me, growing up pretty conservative, hyper, hyper religious rule keeping, it isn't that. To me, it's things like, what's the pursuit of the world? Well, where I am looking, it's greed. It's hyper-consumerism, it's uh, ladder-climbing success orientation, it's Jesus said, look, you know, when he was talking about the parable of the seed being sown in our hearts and what grows up and chokes it out, the cares of this world and the pursuit of wealth. He said, that's the thorns. So we got to think about those things like in terms of how we're going to action justice. You might have seed planted in your heart to care about these things, but what's going to choke it out? Mm -hmm. You know, or in James' words... If you want to do good job with orphans and widows and, you know, tied to that all through the Old Testament, the four categories, orphans, widows, foreigner, poor, right? How are you going to do that? And part of how you're going to do that is by 
guarding your heart against the things that would crowd it out or choke it out, cares of this world, the pursuit of wealth. I think that's an important caveat. Yeah. If we're going to action justice, we're going to have to have a different heart posture around a lot of other things. You know, you can get real bent out of shape and like religious about where I buy my clothes and that I'm never going to a big box store and I'm only going to source things from local farmers. Like, okay, I'm for some of that. But on the flip side, you can get so consumed with how you consume right. that you then have no time or energy to be able to be with someone in your neighborhood that's suffering. Right. And I think so we just keep remembering that it is a gospel of grace, not a gospel of law. Oh, right. And so we can get so intense about I don't know, like you can't be a lover of Jesus and live in a beautiful place or go on a beautiful vacation. And I think that is not what we're saying at all. We're saying that this, this God, do what God has put in your heart to do in front of you. Yeah. And when you've done that, obedience, he desires obedience rather than sacrifice. So we're yeah. just, I, I think I'm call, I am I feel the Holy Spirit calling me to more obedience. Yeah. Not to sacrifice, but to obedience. And and I think that's what our hope would be on this podcast, that people would be called to obedience. And so maybe the teacher inside of me says this, I know that whenever my heart is stirred towards something, that it's really important that I write it down. Because otherwise I think about it and then I go away and I, that was nice. So I would just encourage everybody who's listening, may, maybe you need to take stock of what's in front of you. What are the things that God is calling you to do? Yeah. Do you have a local school in front of you that you can go and ask about the felt needs in the community? Or do you have an immigrant family that lives on your block that you can find out, you know, maybe they're refugees? Like, what's in front of you? And I always say to people, like, how do you get relationship? I get asked that question all the time. And the thing that I constantly am telling people is you get relationship by showing up. You get relationship by walking down your street and smiling at someone when they pass you and you say, hi. And then you see that person consistently and you say, lovely day, isn't it? And then you ask about their kid or their dog or whatever. And in six months, you might be able to share a cup of tea in a park or you might be able to, right? Like relationships Fine. incremental. We're in an incremental mustard seed kingdom. Like we should be people who know how to do this. Don't run out and start a program. No. Just don't. Don't, go get a, don't spend $10,000 to start a not-for-profit. Right. I, I had somebody come to me recently and they're like, well, the Lord told me I'm going to start all these orphan villages in this country and that country and da 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 And I was like, so what are you doing where you are in Kamloops? Yeah. You know, like get on the ground, like start with something incremental. If it grows to some awesome, amaze bomb thing, great. But that's never how we begin. No. And oftentimes when we start big like that, we start our, we set ourselves up for tremendous failure, tremendous mm -hmm. failure. If I had to do the things I'm doing now, 20 years ago, <laughs> I you wouldn't have been able to. No, I wouldn't have been able to shoulder it. I wouldn't have been able, I would have made a fool of myself. And I think, you know, that's 20 years in the game, though. I've been at this 20 years. Yeah. Which sounds awfully long. Yeah. But I don't feel more than 20. So that is the thing. <laughs> and that's the thing for you, too. I think you hear 20 years and you think, well, I don't have time like that. Yes, you do. Totally. Yes, you do. It's the slow, steady. And if all of us, you know, get awakened to God's heart to engage with justice in our local context. I mean, that is going to be transformational presence. That's, you know, when Jesus said, you're going to do greater things, he wasn't talking like, you can't do greater than raising yourself from the dead, right? He's talking greater than like more, like the, the greater than math sign, right? And that's the multiplication, the work of the Holy Spirit in us and through us. I really, really, really want to encourage people just just incremental baby steps like what about Bob you know just like get going and find your way forward and I think the narrative that'll come out of that the hindsight is always wonderful right which is why sometimes I hesitate to tell some of our amazing stories because then everybody wants to go out and have that happen in week one those things have come out of a life lived and like Jess said we've got a lot of sad stories as well and hard things that we haven't seen changed and a lot of stirred heart longing that we just go God when and how and you know and I'm still asking those questions I hope I ask them till the day I die but I'm going to keep putting my hand to the plow yep so get out there and get at it talk to you soon Thanks for listening to another episode of Down to Earth. 
We hope you've enjoyed listening and feel inspired to grow in your relationship with God and to engage your life in ways that shape your culture and community. If you enjoyed today's episode, please take a moment and leave a review on iTunes. Not only does it let us know how we're doing, but it helps other people find the show. Remember, if you have any comments, questions, or feedback, please leave them in the comments on this episode at downtoearthpodcast.com.